to survive because telling the truth just does not pay very well. Uh, uh, so it, it is the generosity of those that value the work that allows us to do what it is we do when we're out here, you know, actually speaking the truth. <laughs> anyway, Jordan, yeah, you're right. You know, the, the series on religion has been rather <laughs> fascinating. Now, you brought up something because I was chatting with you a little bit before we went to air um, that uh, I, I had to admit, and this is not something you hear out of my mouth too often when it comes to this subject, quite honestly, but um, there, there happens to be a rather important book that I haven't read really at all. I think I might have looked at it as a reference, and you wanted to discuss it tonight, so I'm just going to turn it over to you and uh, let us let us begin the discussion on religion here on uh, this, the 18th episode of it. <laughs> wow, I, it's, it's hard to believe we've done 18 shows. We've done 17 shows, I'll be darned. Well, tonight I wanted to talk about an, a book <clears throat> supposedly written uh, in the ancient Grecian Empire, in ancient Greek. And it is still today uh, a major book from the ancient world that's been translated and retranslated so many times. <clears throat> and today you can still buy it in a bookstore. You can order it. It's called The Theogony of Hesiod. That's T H E O. G-O-N-Y, and Hesiod is H-E-S-I-O-D, the Theogony of Hesiod. <clears throat> what, the, the, what the word Theogony simply means <clears throat> is The is God in Greek, and the Greek language T-H-E represents God. <clears throat> Agony is the story of, so Theogony is the story of God. And it's written by a man called Hesiod, which is strange because Hesiod starts off with saying he was illiterate and couldn't read or write. So Hesiod was told that about 700 B.C. And he was an illiterate herdsman. And in his book, he explains that one night while he was out watching the, the flock and his herds that he was responsible for, <clears throat> he said three glowing angels <clears throat> three angels that were glowing came floating up to him they didn't walk up they came down and floated across the, the land until they came up to him and they said to him that they were called muses m-u-s-e-s -E the three muses the word muses which he is called which i'm saying were angels but the three muses gives us our word museum and music and amusement. Muses were the three angels that came up to Hesiod while he was watching his flock at night. Well, George, George and, let me throw something else in here because uh, something occurred to me at the beginning <laughs> of what you were talking about. Now, amuse has been utilized in the word muse and what a muse is. I want you to go into that in more detail. But before we get there... Uh, when you were talking about, you know, Theo or The uh, at the beginning, theology, right? This is where, where the word comes from. Um, mm -hmm. Here's an interesting thought about that. In the English language today, when we apply the capital V, it means that it is a singular and primary, right? Yes, singular primary, right. So, I mean, it, it still carries on, meaning almost like the God of or the singular primary of something mm -hmm. right and That's so right. like if i say the radio show i'm talking about a very specific one and only one when yep. i say the house i'm talking about one particular house and not any house not a house not houses <laughs> but actually it's a singular which i always find interesting because um that, that that's still survives echoing in the language today and even like you said with the word muse now, there are arguments about what a muse actually is because it's a disembodied, but muses have played a role through a, a lot of different religious organizations when it comes to speaking about different creatures and deities and elements and angels and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways to interpret what a muse is, isn't there? Well, yes. Basically, a muse is a spirit entity, a, an angel. It's something of another world. It's not of our world. Muses were something 
it goes back to, as I said, it gives us our word museum or music or amusement. Muse simply means something that's not of our world, some sort of a creature, a glowing angel is what the script, I mean, is what the book said, glowing angels. And they said that they were called muses. And uh, and when you talk about the, as you were saying about the being primary and first, if I was, say, appointed to work directly for the president of the United States on a private basis, but just between him and I, and and so we're talking, we were talking, you and I are talking in a, in a over dinner one night, and, and I, so you're telling me what job you have, and you say, well, I'm working for this guy, I'm working for this man who's do, doing this, this, and that, and I would say, I'm working for the man, you're working for a man, I'm working for the man, meaning the, the highest you can get, the best and the most singular highest. The, uh, you have a car, if I got a Maserati, I got the car. And so the implies singular and the best of the best. And so that's where we get this this idea that in in the Greek that the word for God is T-H-E-O, Theo. A lot of uh, Greek, a lot of Greek men have the name Theo. Theo is God in Greek. Therefore, if you're going to study about God, you have something called theology. And this Theogony of Hesiod is a book about the gods and the heavens. And and so to go on, Hesiod lived about 700 B.C., we're told, and he was an illiterate herdsman. And he was out one night, uh, as the story goes in the book, uh, watching his flock, and uh, and three angels, it says three angels came up to him. They floated up. They didn't walk up. They were, they were spirit creatures. They came and floated up to him. And they told him that telepathically they talked to him. And they told Hesiod that they wanted him to write a book about the gods that ruled over the heavens. And it was a whole story about the pecking order of the gods in heaven. Who's up there and who's doing what? And who's in charge of what? And who's over who? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So they wanted Hesiod to write this book about the gods that ruled in the heavens. Well, Hesiod told them, "I can't read or write," and they told him that they could not that, that it would be okay because they could help guide him by automated writing. All he has to do is put the pen to the paper, and they will move his hand and write the whole story for him. So he doesn't have to know how to read or write. Just write down what we tell you to write, and we'll make you we'll make you do it right, and then we'll put publish the book. So they begin to download the pecking order of the gods over the heavens. And they told him that the particular god over our solar system, those, the one we live in, our particular section in the Milky Way galaxy, and they told him the God that's over the earth and over our particular solar system in the Milky Way galaxy is a God named Zeus, Z-E-U-S. Zeus was the God over the earth. That's what these three angels told him. And they said that Zeus lived in a floating city in the constellation, star constellation of Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is a very famous constellation in the heavens, and they and the angels told Hesiod that Zeus, the god over the earth, lives in a constellation. He lives in a floating city in the constellation of Cassiopeia. And the muses went on to tell Hesiod that if Zeus were to drop an anvil from his front porch, it would take nine days and nine nights and so many hours for it to hit the earth well it is easy to calculate that distance if we assume that you know how fast an anvil would fall on earth i know it would be different in space but we're just assuming that for his from talking to hesiod that they were talking about how fast an anvil will fall on the earth 
And they said if Zeus were to drop an anvil from his front porch in Cassiopeia, it would take nine days and nine nights for it to fall and so many hours and minutes until it would hit the earth. And so as I said, it's easy to calculate that distance, which would, on a computer, you can calculate how far that would be. <clears throat> and it is a little over three million miles from Earth. <clears throat> three million miles, God lives, the God Zeus lives from the Earth. And so according to Hesia and the three muses, Zeus was referred to by the muses as our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, Zeus. That's where it comes from, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, Zeus. And he lived about three million miles from the earth in a constellation in our heavens, as I said, called Cassiopeia. Now, back in 1930, there was an American astronomer named Carl Jansky. J-A-N-S-K-Y. Carl is with a K. Carl Jansky. And Carl Jansky built the first radio telescope ever. And he won the Nobel Prize for being the father of modern radio telescopes. He then, Carl Jansky, also built later a radio transmitter so he could beam signals to the heavens uh, that he could you know, uh, observe through his radio telescope. And so he would build a radio transmitter and to beam signals to the heavens. And that was in 1930s. Also in the 1930s, just to see what might happen, he, Carl Jansky, did transmit a signal to Cassiopeia. We're told it was at 14.3 megacycles to Cassiopeia. And if you can believe it, he got back an intelligent signal that was amplified. And did not know, he did not know what it meant or who sent it, but it was an amplified message, meaning the message he got back from Cassiopeia of aiming it at that particular star system was a very overwhelmingly obvious intelligent signal. What he could not read because he didn't know the language, but it was a signal that was coming in crystal clear. And so when Carl Jansky died. He made notes of all of this, and all of his notes were t immediately taken from his office by, quote, men wearing black suits. That should tell you something. The, uh, the, the book talked about how when he passed away, men in black suits came in and raided his home, his office, and took all of his notes. Well, that doesn't sound strange to me, because the world is run by men in black. Now, in the mid-1940s, 10 years later, a Scottish astronomer named Duncan Luan, L-U-N-A-N, -N, Duncan Luan, was working with Carl Jansky's radio transmitter. This is a Scottish astronomer. And he, too, sent out a signal aimed at Cassiopeia. And he, too, got back a signal about 20 seconds later both intelligent and amplified, and he didn't know what to make of it either. He didn't know what was being said. He couldn't read it, but he knew it was intelligently sent and very amplified. So somebody was definitely answering on that radio telescope. But Duncan Lunan narrowed the signal down to a star or a particular light in Cassiopeia's, which today we call the Lunan object. Look it up in a, in a in an encyclopedia. L U N A N, Lunan object. It would tell you a particular star, a particular star or light in Cassiopeia constellation is where there's a powerful signal coming. When you send out a signal out to Cassiopeia, one comes back and it's coming back from a place called the Lunan object. Now, the word of God in Greek, as I've told you before, is theos, T-H-E-O-S. Theos is God. And the chief theos or God was called in our, in our, on our earth, the chief God over our earth 
was uh, the word is generally God is Theos, but the chief God over the earth is called Zeus, so God the Father of all other gods. He's supposedly the ultimate God over the earth in our particular area of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. So to the ancient Greeks in prayer, it would be our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Zeus. Now look at the word our Father. Father. In the ancient Sanskrit, which is the ancient Hindu Sanskrit, Father is Pita. P-I-T-A-R. Pita. And in the old Persian, the word for father is P-I-T-A. So Sanskrit is P-I-T-A-R, but old Persian is P-I-T-A. While in Greek and Latin, father is pater, P-A-T-E-R, pater. This is where we get the, the term pitter pater. Pitter pater is the name for God in Sanskrit, old Persian, Greek and Latin, pitter and patter. So the ancient words for God was pitter patter. Again, in ancient Greek, the father God was Zeus, spelled Z E U S. And since he was the father God, he was our father, the holy father in heaven, he would be, that would be spelled Z E U S hyphen P A T E R, Zeus Pater, our God, the father. So in Latin, the word God is not Zeus, Z-E-U-S, but in Latin is D-E-U-S. <clears throat> God in, in the ancient world was Z-E-U-S, but in Latin is D-E-U-S. So you interchange the Z with a D. So in ancient Rome, God, or Zeus, was called, in the ancient Roman Empire, go back and read it, you will see that Zeus was called in Rome, I-U, capital I-U, hyphen, Peter, P-I-P-E-T-E-R, I-U, Peter. I's are, of course, interchangeable with J's, so that Zeus, or I-U, Peter, becomes J-U Peter, or Jupiter. So Jupiter was the king of the gods in Rome, which is Jupiter, for God the Father, Zeus. So in the day, so today I've been there to the Vatican, and in the Vatican today there is a statue of the Apostle Peter. <clears throat> that encyclic, the encyclopedias the world over will tell you that the Apostle Peter's statue in the Vatican is not Peter, but Zeus, Pater. The Roman Zeus was called J.U. Peter or Jupiter. So today, Catholics and Christians around the world that go to the Vatican are still on their knees praying to, and in the Vatican in particular, actually kissing the feet of the Apostle Peter, which is actually Jew Peter. Zeus. So well, today right, in the yeah. central. Well, I was, just, again. I was just going to say that uh, when when I was learning to translate Latin, uh, th this is exactly what came up: is that Jupiter is effectively Zeus, and Jupiter, the the way it's written in Latin, it's written a, a couple of different ways, and uh, one of them does involve the uh, the, the patri patriarum, you know, just like yep. we, we we use the word patronage or paternity. Or, uh, you know, patriarch, you know, these kinds of words all come from this, uh, from this, uh, root Latin for father, which, uh, which you just got ex done explaining, but it is part of the, the word for Jupiter, which is the highest of the, uh, Roman gods when they were using Latin. So, that's right. Um, there you go. It, 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 it's interesting that, uh, that they actually maintain almost the same pantheon. It's a slightly different one from the Greeks. There's a yep. slight difference, right. but just uh, a little bit, yeah. just a little bit of a difference, yeah. But you know, the both, Romans, yeah. Romans got most of what they got from the Greeks anyway. Well, right, but both uh, sets of what people generally refer to as mythology actually mm -hmm. contain these muses too, which is another thing. I, I know I'm going back to it again, 
but here's the thing today this also survives you know in, in a poetic uh sort of uh, interesting creative writing way right where people discuss mm -hmm. a muse and a muse generally means an inspiration which uh, drives one toward creativity when it's used in this way and it is uh something that is not really fully quantifiable. A lot of times in love poems, for instance, uh, uh, Jordan, in, in, a, in a literary sense, just, just to take a look at what is still in use today, one might say that, uh, you know, the woman they're in love with when they're writing love poems is their muse for writing it because they are the inspiration. They're not really sure how this all comes to them, but they seem to be inspired by just the mere thought of, not necessarily even the person, but just the mere thought of. So the mm -hmm. spirit of the individual drives them to create the love poem. I know it sounds a little convoluted, but it's literally where this reference uh, still survives today, uh, as well in, as in all those words you mentioned before, amusement, museum, music, uh, so on and so forth. But it's just uh, kind of interesting that the echoes still remain, even when the meaning seems to have changed. And, That's uh, right. It, and, and you're showing the complete passing of time here by, you know, by showing us Zeus to Jupiter. Because that was always an odd thing for me when, you know, when they were teaching me about Latin and I was doing the proper classes on it. Right. Um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it, saying to myself, how is it that they got from one to the other? Uh, <laughs> you know, like they, nobody explained that there. They just wanted you to know that's what this means. Um, but it, but it was interesting to to take a look at how you know the, these words continue to survive and the reason why they mean what they mean it it, it begins to make sense and uh, also see Jordan's work on how English is a designer language but anyway uh, back to the story that you're telling us here uh, and and the, this is really fascinating about these communications from Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia because. Uh, according to the mainstream records, if you will, there's only ever been one signal that they can't, you know, that what they call the wow signal, right? That, uh -huh. uh, that seems to be intelligent that nobody can quite explain, but then others have tried to explain away. Um, these two other interactions where they beamed a signal directly to a particular point, given this information and then received something back. You don't see this spoken about in a lot of places, Jordan. I wonder why that is. Yes, I wonder why, because the governmental system on the earth does not want you to know what they know. They are in a superior position to know everything, and you are in the inferior position. And basically, as George Carlin said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. So they're not about to tell you what they know. They already know things about the world we live in and the heavens and the gods and the spirits, the governmental systems in this world are well aware of this kind of knowledge, but they're not telling you why, because they are no possible way they are equal to the powers in the heavens over the gods. And so they don't want you to know. They want you to think that they are the most powerful force in all the universe. The governmental structures in America, they believe themselves to be almighty gods. And they don't want you to know that they know that there are extraterrestrial life forms out there that are far, far more powerful and frightening, and they will not be able to deal with them. And they know that they will not be able to deal with the powers of the gods, the spirit creatures, these extraterrestrials. And they don't want you to know that they are scared to death of these things. That's why they quietly are researching UFOs and aliens and all kinds of other world stuff that's going on because the government knows they're out there for sure and that they cannot do anything about it because whatever's out there is far, far more superior to anything the earth has. And so they don't want you knowing that because then you will not turn your attention to the government. You will turn your attention to the gods. Well, even worse and, than that, Jordan, uh, the possibility that would then exist if this was a, uh, a relatively open secret, let's just say. Um, we could literally find a way, devise a way, possibly, you know, some of us are still intelligent, so... <laughs> you know, haven't been entirely dumbed down by the school systems and the vaccines and everything yet. Um, there, There is the possibility that someone could not only figure out a way as these two gentlemen that you mentioned so far to beam a transmission to, 
uh, and to receive something, but who knows, maybe even interpret it. And in that way, uh, a direct access line to the God uh, or the chief deity, so to speak, um, that almost opens up the possibility for having prayers answered for real. I mean, (laughs) in, in a direct way, like, look, this evil government is upon the planet and plaguing your people, and I am speaking to you, and who knows what you have to say to said chief deity, because I don't believe that all of the bowing and scraping that we're taught to do is exactly right. So, seems to me like, or at least it's not for that God, seems to me like if you did figure out a way to communicate with and to request help from properly... Well, that would cause a lot of problems for all those people who think they have power and sway over this world, wouldn't it? Well, it wouldn't it? If, they, if we were to contact the actual spiritual powers that are in fact over this earth and are watching us and they, they won't interfere with us until we ask for help. I mean, we do the same thing. We could see a child trying to put a toy together and he's busily trying to figure out how to put this toy together. And the father's sitting there watching him. And until the child finally decides he's just not going to be able to do it, he turns to his father and said, would you put this together for me? Then the father can say, okay, now that you asked me, yes, I will do it. I could have done it for you to start with. But I didn't want to interfere in your life. You wanted to play with it, try and fix it. Let's see if you can do it. If you can't, then ask me and I will intervene in your behalf and I will fix it for you. So that's what we're waiting on. That's what the gods are waiting on for us to contact the actual, in fact, spirit powers over this earth and ask them to help us get out of this mess. And that's the only way the human family is going to survive is if we have intervention from out there. Something is going to have to happen on this earth to bring spiritual power back into this world to do something about the incredible corruption that mankind has given birth to in every facet of our institutions, from military, industrial, to uh, uh, to educational, to medical, to law, every single facet of our life is dominated by corruption and evil people. And we're not going to be able to do anything about it because we're just human. And these people have been ruling us and with all of their magical spells and all of their tyranny, and we can't do anything about it. So I believe nothing is going to happen to help, help the human family if we don't have spiritual intervention. I'm talking about calling upon God to help us. And this is what Christianity is supposedly doing, calling upon God to protect us and to guide us, etc. But the more Christian Christianity prays and Judaism prays and Islam prays, the more we have the three great religions praying to God for help. All three are different. So you're, you're talking about praying to pagan idolatry. You're you're not talking to the Almighty God. You're not talking to the original the original powers over the earth. We're talking about a man-made religion called Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so you're talking to man-made institutions which have nothing to do with the actual God force in the universe. And this is why Jesus said to the people of his day, you have formed for yourselves teachers, and therefore the blind leading the blind shall both fall into the pit. So that's what our problem is today. We have all of our preachers and holy men, and we got them on. We got them by the dozens on Sunday morning on television. All the preachers, but those preachers are preaching to us because they went to a university a college to learn how to tell us about all this silly nonsense. They go to college and the university and get a degree so that they can become a Christian minister and make millions of dollars flying around their jets. And so the bottom line is, is that we humans have formed for ourselves, our teachers. They have to go to our universities and they have to get their brownie points from the, from the, from the powers that be. And so it's a really interesting story about how we've been 
totally deflected from what we should be doing, and that is contacting the great spirit of our of our world, the gods who have created us, and do something about the situation that we humans are in. But we'll never do that because we're locked into our own religions that we, as Jesus said, you have formed for yourselves, teachers. God has not brought you teachers. You form for yourselves teachers. You send your kids to the university to get a degree, and that's this way that they are accredited because they have Caesar's imprimatur on them. Caesar says it's okay that they can be a minister. Now they can be appointed as a minister. Why? Because they have read your books that you wrote, and they have, and they have adopted all of your silly understanding of theology, and now they can be a minister. You have formed for yourselves teachers, while the spirit is no one's listening to. And so that's we get back to Zeus. Well, right before we get back to Zeus, I want to actually enter a question that's come in because it is relevant since we're going to focus on Zeus some more. Um, they ask, uh, we, we hear a lot of talk about father in your equation about the god or gods and how they were organized where is mother in all of this and mother is in quotes now this is the question as asked um and i I think it is relevant so uh go ahead yeah well the mother of part of god in the hebrew religion the jewish religion The mother part of God, because God said, the Bible says in Genesis, that God made us in his image and likeness. And then it goes on to say, in the male and female, he made us in his image, implying that God is both male and female. He made us in his image and likeness. And then it goes on to say that he made us man and woman, male and female, in his image. So there is a female part to this concept of God. And in the Christian tradition, it's Mary, the mother of God, Mary, the mother. She is the mother. And Mary is based on, of course, the constellation of uh, of uh, Mary is the Mary is based on oh, no. the ancient concept of the mother goddess. And, and it goes back to uh, the constellation of Virgo, because all of our religion is based on the heavens. And so the 12 apostles are the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 days, the 12, uh, the 12 uh, apostles or the 12 jurors on the jury system who bring to light the, the truth with the light, uh, the 12 Everything is 12 in the Bible based on the 12 signs of the Zodiac or the 12 months of the year. And Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. Of course, the sun is the light of the world. And so the whole of the New Testament is a symbolic story telling you about the light and the heavens of the sun and the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And one of the most important signs of the Zodiac is Virgo, Virgo the Virgin. And so there, one of the 12 apostles has to be a woman, which it is. You go back to the paintings, you'll see sitting on the right hand of Jesus and the, and the painting of, uh, of the Last Supper. You will see the Last Supper painting on the right hand side of Jesus is a woman sitting. There are 12 apostles, but one of them is a woman, Virgo, the virgin. And so uh, the, the entire world of theology and religion in the western world the way we understand god in spiritual subjects is is all based on what happens in the northern hemisphere with the sun and the stars and the planets and the constellations of the zodiac it's all astrological and people are now trying to make out people have been trying for thousands of years to make the astrological symbolism into actual History is no history is in the Bible. It's not historical. It's not a historical story. It has nothing to do with history. It is a it is an encoded uh, symbol, symbolic encoded story. 
And if you don't understand the Bible as a symbol and an encoded story, we do have a lot of books today being written about Bible codes. Well, that's what it is. The Bible is a code, but it's a big code. The whole thing is a biblical code. And the code is the heavens, the life of the heavens, the sun with the stars and the moon and the constellations of the zodiac and all the stars. This is what the Bible is talking to us about, the life we live in this universe, the life we live in this in this solar system. But going back to Zeus, <clears throat> Zeus was very well known and respected as the almighty God in the ancient Greek world and really truly believed that he was the almighty God. There was not just a little silly religion. No, the people of the ancient world really believed that the almighty God's name was Zeus. And so we even have a canal in the Middle East called Suez Canal, which is Zeus spelled backwards, S-U-E-Z, instead of Z-E-U-S. Suez Canal is Zeus spelled backwards. So Zeus is the almighty God over the earth, according to the Theogony of Hesiod, according to the ancient, uh, all the ancient religions. And so while we're on the subject of Greek, Zeus becomes a Roman Jupiter. Another name for Jupiter was Jove, J-O-V-E, is the name for the, for the planet Jupiter, for the god Jupiter. His name was Jove, a term that was given to him. So that when you hear someone say that God is love, We've heard that for so many years, God is love. That makes no intellectual sense at all. What are you talking about? God is love. That makes no sense at all. No. Why? Because it, it's actually God is Jove, J-O-V-E, not L-O-V-E. God is Jove or Jupiter and or Zeus, ultimately. And so in the ancient world, it was believed that the god Zeus protected royalty. This is one of the things that is in all the reference books about the ancient gods is that Zeus appointed himself. He appointed whoever he wished to be royalty. And so it was said he appointed royalty and he protected them. This is why we can say today that Zeus, our god, chooses the royalty or they have a divine right of kings they have a divine right because zeus appointed them and protects them and so one last thing god in latin is d-e-u-s deus deus is god or deus in old persian is d-a-i-v-a that's the way it is spelled in old persian deus in latin latin Spanish is D-E-U-S, but in the old Persian, D-E-U-S is spelled D-A-I-V-A, Diva, which means an evil and demonic, an evil and demonic God. So by a dictionary definition, that would be that Christianity worldwide is worshiping an ancient demonic God. That might be, that might explain the wars and bloodshed and human slavery and thousands of years of all of the tragedies that have gone on in, in religion throughout the world and going on today because we, are, we have not contacted the actual spiritual presence in the universe, the real legitimate God. We're still worshiping the old ancient God just as Christianity and Judaism are doing today. And, of course, Islam has been doing it for hours since it started. So Zeus, we're told, ruled from Mount Olympus. But we all know that there's at least 15 other holy mountains, according to the different races of people in the world. Mount Fuji in Japan, the you know, Mount, mountain of the gods. Or Mount Ararat in the Armenian world, or our Mount Athros, A-T-H-O-S in Greek. We have the gods who lived in Mount Everest in the Himalayan or Mount Shasta in California. And as you may have already figured out, Mount Olympus becomes for the mountain, ancient Middle Eastern um, Arabian moon cult. 
and then the ancient Middle Eastern moon cult, the god of that cult will live in this mountain called Sin, A-I. He, the god of the moon was called Sin, S-I-N, look it up in the dictionary, and the mountain was A-I. So you put the god of the mountain, Sin, with A-I, it becomes Mount Sinai. And of course today, the, the Hebrews have not only Mount Sinai, but they got Mount Zion. And so Mount Sinai is actually the mountain of the moon god. The moon god's name was Sin, and Ai was a mountain. The mountain of Sin, the A, Sin Ai is Mount Sinai. So with all of this, the ancient moon god of Arabia was called Sin, but today he is called Allah, and in Hebrew, Yahweh. And so the most holy mountain in the ancient Arabic world moon cult was Mount Sinai or Sin Ai. The Hebrew word Sin was the, was the god of the moon. And the Hebrew moon cult is Mount Zion. So today when you hear Mount Jews talking about Mount Zion and you hear all the silly preachers and, and all the other goofy, ill-informed, unread goofballs out there on Sunday morning talk about Mount Zion. You better go back and do some homework and figure out what Zion means and where it came from because Mount Zion is simply a hill in the area that is today known as Phoenicia Cana. That was a Canaanite mountain with the ancient Canaanites worship God on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a Canaanite God from the ancient Canaanite religion. Today has been promoted all over the world as Judaism and, and Christianity is an incredible story of betrayal and ignorance by the people of this world who have been misled. Nobody seems to do any reading. Nobody seems to care about it. They just give the money to the church. You go and follow the, the group. They follow the group. Everybody goes in together. They all feel better because they are going to church. They're worshiping God which is Theo. This is why the ancient Greeks, when they would worship Theo, they went to something called a theater. So this is what uh, a church is. It's a theater. It's a God show. You're going to the God show to worship the God, T-H-E-O. And therefore, it's a theater. It's a God show. So anyway, and when you get into the, the lunacy of what is called the Holy Land, there's nothing holy in the Holy Land, but the stories that come out of it, they're full of holes. The incredible story is that there is nothing holy in Jerusalem, nothing, period. There's nothing of any value, uh, of any intrinsic spiritual value in the Holy Land. It's nothing but politics and money. Intellectually, it's, it's, it's bankrupt. It has nothing to offer the human race in the, in the Middle East. And it's a, a horrible story of betrayal. And the people have no idea they've been worshiping uh, uh, you know, pagan gods for thousands of years. And we're still today, the more we change, the more we stay the same. We're still worshiping the powers that be and never realizing that we're talking about demonic depravity in the Middle East we call religion. And boy, when you go back and look at what's going on in the world today between religions and the Middle East, it's obvious, as Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. What is the fruitage of our religions today if it is at wars and violence, pornography, uh, you know, all the child sacrifice, slavery, uh, drugs, alcohol, wars, incredible mess that the human family is in because we've been following the people who are blind, the ones that we have appointed to teach us. We sent them to our colleges and we wrote the books and they have to read the books and then answer the questions and then they could get the imprimatur of Caesar who will give them a, 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 a uh, an award for their hard work. He will give them a, a degree. It's called a degree from college. You get a college degree, and now you can go and teach religion because Caesar has given you his imprimatur. You can now go teach religion. And so 
Well, you know, Jordan, if you don't mind, just for a quick second, uh, a a question was asked that is relevant to exactly where you're at. And uh, they, they, uh, let's see, yeah, David, first of all, he asked me not to pick on him for his name, David. But uh, secondly, he says, uh, let's see, we're, we're, hold on. I had it and I rolled it down. Oh, hang on a second. There it is. Uh, do Okay. Yeah. Here's, here's the question. Uh, do Zionists and what are mainstream Jews worship two different gods because they are not worshiping Zeus and they do worship some sort of God? Okay. Yeah. So th- there, there's a bit more to this, but that's that's basically the question: is do Zionists and you know your your run of the mill Jew, I guess, do they do they worship different gods? Is the question? No, they're both worshiping the same god. One actually worshiping that god; the other are ignorant. They don't even know that god exists. The Zionists are worshiping a political superstructure, money, and political power of the American. Judeo, Judeo Christian American military industrial complex. So if you're talking about Zionism, you're talking about America and the military. You're talking about money and banking and governmental power, firepower. And this is why Israel and America are the two countries that are developing nuclear power and are selling more armaments to the world, the one country is selling armaments to the world for wars, the most prolific producers of armaments and uh, materials for war is the state of Israel. And the second most uh, prolific is America. So America and Israel are war power based on the military industrial complex. There's nothing holy about Zionism. We're talking about the Rothschilds, the Rockefeller money, the international banking cartels of the Knights Templars were talking about building of the temple in Jerusalem by the Rothschild Rockefeller Cabal. There's nothing holy in Israel whatsoever, and until we wake up and discover we've been lied to and deceived by the secret societies, uh, that run the world behind the scenes. And my God, if you don't know anything about the secret society that's running the world, then where have you been? Because the whole world is overwhelmingly obvious, being run by corrupt politicians, corrupt people, and banking and government and education and law enforcement. Our courts are corrupt. Our people are corrupt. Our educational systems are corrupt. The military is corrupt. The whole entire earth is lying in the power of the dark side. And we don't even realize it. We don't even see what's coming. Right. And it's see, really... The reason why David asked this, because I'm looking further at the rest of what he wrote, is because you had mentioned Mount Zion, and, uh, you know, he was trying to, to create a, co- a, a correlation there between is there a different God sort of being worshipped at Mount Zion than there is at Mount Sinai, uh, uh, is, is, I guess, the rest of the question. He didn't really ask a question. He was just making some comments along with it. And, and that's why he asked about Zionists, because obviously if you hear Mount Zion, you're going to think Zionist, you know? Uh, that's right. So uh, that, that, that's why he was asking that question, because if there's different mountains, there might be a different God that's supposedly being serviced by making uh, a trek up a mountain or whatever. And and the concept that this gets you closer to God, this is actually a common theme throughout oh, just about every religious order where there is a mountain that you can get closer to God or to God-like status or whatever because in all cases it seems as though God is up there and out there somewhere. Yeah, so, he's up there. He's up there in the heavens. And so to get closer to him, you go up in the mountain. Well, you're that much closer. You know, and in actual reality, you know, you're not even, you're not even uh, you know, anywhere near close to God because to be close to God is a spiritual thing. Climbing up into a mountain, you think you're going up higher to contact God. That was the idea behind all the temples built on mountains and that God was up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, Mount. Mount Fuji, you know, Mount, Mount, uh, Mount this, Mount that. It's always high up as, as where God lived. And so 
Well, the reason, we have, reason for this is because it's measurement in the mind of a child. I mean, we're, yeah. we're, we're almost at the end of the first hour, so I'm just going to throw this in there to, to explain where you're going uh, really quickly because – this, I think, is relevant. When you, when you walk with a child and a child walks a mile, they feel as though they've walked across the whole earth, you know. Yep. They've walked forever. An hour takes a long time because in the mind of a child, it's a large thing because they don't know that much of the world. Well, even when we're fully grown and we're adults, so to speak, uh, how much of the universe do we truly understand? Not very much, probably about as much as that child that thinks a mile is, you know, the, the, the entire width of the world. <laughs> yep, so right. comparatively speaking, to go up a mountain, we've climbed for miles, for days, for weeks. You really mm-hmm. hardly done anything as far as a well, set. That's right. <laughs> and like Martin yeah. Luther King said, I've been to the mountaintop. I've been to the mountaintop, meaning symbolically, I've been spiritually i've gone up to the mountaintop and talked with the guys who run the planet the cabal the rockefeller the rothschild the international criminal elite i've been to the mountaintop and talked with them and and then he went on to say i like everybody else i would like to live but with me it doesn't matter anymore because i've been to the mountaintop in other words he talked to the most powerful people on the planet and he knew he's going to die they're going to sacrifice him real soon. And he said, I've been to the mountaintop. He's not talking to the almighty God. No, he's talking to the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds. And this is why the Rockefellers and Rothschilds are part of the cabal who runs the earth. So if you're going to, if you were going to talk to God, talk to the one that's going to be like God, go to the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and talk to them because that's as good as God, as close as the God as you're going to get. Because you don't know how to deal with the other God. You don't know how to deal and communicate with the real God. All right. And you, so, you're traveling three million miles to Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia, depending on how you pronounce it. Not something that most of us are going to realistically have the chance to do in our lifetimes. Uh, however, even if we could get there, even if we could get face to face, we know how to communicate. Could we handle the communication? Is it something that we're capable of? Well, guess what? A lot of things have been created to make sure that you never have the chance to even look in the right direction to move toward learning how to do that. And it seems like, oh, I don't know, all of these organized religions have been devised specifically to do just that. Am I out of my mind, Jordan? No, no, that's what I said. We have formed, we humans, the scripture says, you have formed for yourselves teachers. So we're not looking to someone who is an actual spiritual man who's studied it and has devoted his life to to researching and finding where the spirit comes from, where the God force comes from, what it is all really about, where religion has come from, the etymology of the words and the terms, and has devoted his life to understanding the spiritual things of this world. We're not looking to that person. We have, we don't need that kind of a person because why? Because we've got our own teachers. We've set up our colleges and universities and we send our children to school so they could get a degree and therefore they could come out and be a minister and a minister of the gospel. Why? Because they got a degree from Caesar, the Tiberius Caesar who sees himself as a god. He decides who will preach about God and who won't, what they will say and what they won't say. And so, therefore, if you get a degree to talk about God, there's certain things you cannot talk about in public. There's certain things you cannot say because Caesar will not allow it. He's the one that gave you permission to be a minister. He put his imprimatur of his government on you. And so, therefore, you have a degree, which means you teach what Caesar tells you to teach. You go to the university. And you learn what to talk about. You learn what to tell the people. And it's all been worked out a long time ago by the elites who run our world behind the scenes. They will tell you what they want you to tell the people. And if you tell them correctly the way that you're supposed to tell them, uh, then you will be promoted in the church. And you find out what the word church means. You should be ashamed of yourself to even go to a church when you find out what that means. So that's why in the Bible and the book of Revelation, I think it is, where 
the Bible says, get out of her, my people, if you don't want to suffer with her plagues and what's going to happen to her. And the Bible has Jesus saying, by the people of this world are ignorant. My people are dying from a lack of knowledge. The scripture says that in the Old Testament too, my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. That is exactly the case today. Where there is no vision, the people are dying. That's a scripture in the Bible that says that. Where there is no vision, my people are perishing. It's true because where there is no vision, meaning the people don't see. The scripture says, Jesus said, you have eyes, but you do not see. You have ears, but you don't hear. And with your heart, you don't get the sense of it implying that you the world of mankind has eyes but they don't see anything they're ignorant ill-informed unread and unstudied they don't know what the words mean they have no background and understanding where government comes from who prints your money how the banks operate what you uh, who comes up with the law we are supposedly under the law but nobody knows where that law comes from or who wrote that law we just have to abide by it and so we finally figure out, finally at this late time in human history, we're now beginning to realize that the human race has been treated like a bunch of dogs. We're all animals. We're not called masculine or feminine. We're called male and female, according to the Encyclopedia of Reference Works. A male and a female, according to the way it's written, a male and females are animals. They are like a dog. That's why dogs are a male or a female. That's why on your driver's license and on your identification, it will tell us male or female. It doesn't say masculine or feminine. Because masculine and feminine is a, is a term used to describe a man or woman. But if you're an animal, they describe you as male and female. That's in the, that's in the law. You go in the law library and read about the term male and female means you're an animal. And if you're an animal, who cares what you believe? We just tell you anything because the powers that be know better. They're not about to tell you what's really going on and who's really running this world. And, and I know that this government, the United States government, without a doubt, and probably Russia and all the other governments, especially the Germans, have been dabbling with extraterrestrial life forms. We call them EBs, e -E -B -B -E -S extraterrestrial biological entities we call them aliens but they are here there's no doubt that there is a higher intelligence from out there who have come here or who have been here all along and we're the new people on the block we humans are the new ones on the block and that the extraterrestrials that we talk about are actually the creatures that have been here from day one for millions of years they've been here we just we just arrived, and so we don't see them, and we don't understand them. So we say there are aliens from out there. Maybe they're not from out there. Maybe they're from here. Maybe this is where they were originally formed was here. So I'm just saying that there's a whole lot about theology and God that you just don't know anything about. And you better wake up and get out of her, my people, like the scripture says. If you're going to churches, you better go back and do some homework because you're going to find out when you leave this world, if you go before a God and have to, uh, uh, you know, if you have to, uh, you know, talk about what you were and what you did when you were alive, if you have to go before some kind of a judgment, if you do, you're going to be in big trouble when you find out that what you thought was true was not true and that you have been listening to people who went to your schools and went to your colleges and were reading your books that you humans made together. You humans made these books and put these colleges together and all of these goofballs and reverends and holy ones all went to the university, got their college degree and they got accredited by Caesar and now they're telling you what they are told to tell you. And therefore, they can make a lot of money. So therefore, going to college is nothing more than getting a work permit.
You can now go out and call right. yourself a doctor. And you know what? You get that work permit so you can go to the circus, believe it or not. But we'll tell you more about that in the next hour. Jordan Maxwell is with me. Of course, jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that it is. We'll talk to you a little more about that as well. The next one is here at O'Kelly.com. But with me tonight for part 18 on religion, believe it or not, Jordan Maxwell. And, uh, yeah, there was a, a few weeks in between there where we didn't do this, but it is still an unending project, really, if you think about it, because there is just so much to cover regarding the, uh, I, I want to call it the grand deception of organized religion, but I mean, it, it goes way past that. And we have the best person in the world to talk about it with. Jordan Maxwell Show.com is his website. If you go over there, by the way, and you go into the research society, you pay the one-time membership fee, and you go in there, there is an incredible section on exactly this topic as well as many others. Plus, there's a lot of uh, stuff that is going to be added to it very soon. A lot of things, you know, being done by the webmaster over there. But also, there is a, a, a public area. You can always email Jordan, make a, a donation to Jordan, especially because he's now trying to buy a new computer and he needs one. Uh, you know, there, there's always just email them and say, Hey, you know, I heard this. I have a question. I, I missed this, or this was a great point. Jordan loves to hear from you guys, uh, in all different ways. So all of your support and feedback is welcome at Jordan Maxwell show.com, which is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. So as we went to break, I said, <laughs> just, just to keep context going here. I said, uh, yeah, you know, when you were talking about people that get degrees in theology and now they get Caesar's mark so that they are allowed to, oh, I don't know, trade in the wares of religion, so to speak, uh, that they get to go to a place and maybe it's not the right place. And I said, yeah, they get to go to the circus. Now, somebody might think I misspoke, Jordan. Um, I didn't. <clears throat> no. So why why is it why is it that I called it the circus? You, you mentioned quickly what you need to know what the word church means. Well, how yeah. about if I turn it over to you and you explain why it is Chuck might have said, "Yeah, you get to go to the circus." <laughs> well, it's because the very word circus comes from a goddess in the Middle East, an ancient goddess called Circe. In the ancient Middle East, there was a goddess named Circe. Talk about goddess or female gods. The one of the most important female goddesses was the ancient goddess called Circe, and C E R E S, a Circe or Circe, and she was referred to as Mother Circe. And so, when the when the uh, Pope Innocent the Thirteenth, when the Pope sent the Knights Templar Masonic military order into the Middle East for the Crusades when the when the Catholic Church sent the military into the Middle East to get rid of all of the uh, Islamic influence in the Middle East so they could take over Rome and control the world from Rome. Uh, the, the, the military guys, the Knights Templars, who you'll see in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, you get that movie, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, or Indiana Jones and the uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark talks about the Knights Templars, the Masonic Order of Knights Templars. Today we call those people, the, the Crusaders, the Knights Templars, we call them international banking elite. They are the people who run the international banks or the cartel, which is running the earth, the international banking cartel or the Knights Templars, or the Masonic Order within the Catholic Church. So that should tell you about something that goes back to the idea that all roads lead to Rome. If you want to know where the money comes from, look at Rome. If you want to know where organized crime comes from, look at Rome. Drug running, Rome. Wars, violence, deception, look at Rome. All roads lead back to the Roman Empire of which the United States today is the is the continuation of the Roman Empire in the world today. We still have a Senate up on the hill. We still have leaders, political leaders in America who think they're Caesar representing God 
Obama thought he was actually representing the almighty God of the universe and could do any damn thing he pleases any time he pleases because he represents the almighty God. And so we have people here who are really believe that they own the human race and that we are nothing more than cattle. We're called chattel in the law. Humans are called chattel, chattel property. We are nothing more than animals that are owned by the gods who think that they run the world. And in point of fact, we, we now are being run by criminals, a criminal elite who believe that they're gods. Well, what's changed? Nothing has changed. Like I said, the more we ch the more we change, the more we stay the same. We're still doing the same thing they did in the Roman Empire. And Caesar went up on the hill. The history book said that Caesar officiated over the Roman Empire from something called a place called Capitoline Hill or Capitol Hill. And today we have a Capitol Hill. And it says in the history books that Caesar each morning would go, quote, up on the hill and to officiate over the Senate, the Roman Senate. And so today, that's exactly what happens. We read about it. We hear about it on the news at night. The, the you know, Caesar went up on the hill and was over and talked with the Senate and was officiating over the Senate. So we have a Roman Senate. The very word senator means an actor. That's why you have to have an act of Congress. Because senators in Latin were actors on a stage. And so they're just acting like they're gods. They're not really gods. They're really just a bunch of crumbs and a bunch of mangy eating dogs. And so, but they're acting like they're officials of the government. Well, the government they put up together, the government that they are in charge of, is actually a man-made institution, and it's crumbling around the world. We can now see around the earth, governments are corrupt. And once you understand how the corruption happened, it happened because of commerce. Commerce an interesting addition, really quickly there, about uh, actors and senators being actors and all that. You know, they, they, they do this thing with bills all the time, and they call them bills. Now, isn't it fascinating that a playbill tells you what's going to be on the stage? Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> they, they deal in bills like playbills, like the theater does. Oh, wait a minute, Theos. Oh, it's all starting to link together. Um, <laughs> yep, you know, that's right. And, and the other thing about all roads leading to Rome, here's another thing to remember, is that, you know, the United States just came into existence only a couple hundred years ago. So one would say there's a big gap between the Roman Empire and the existence of the United States, even no matter where you want to count its beginning uh, as it stands today, uh, it's it's only a couple hundred years back, right? So here's the thing. In the interim, all roads leading to Rome also had something to do with, goes on, with what goes on in what they used to call the British Empire, because even their system of roads today in London, um, is all actually based on, laid over top of the original Roman engineering anyway. And why do you control the roads for commerce, which is exactly where Jordan was going next? I just wanted to throw the extra pieces of connective tissue in there, Jordan, to, yep. uh, to, to make your point even stronger. Not like well, you need yeah. my... I help, right. but I but I but I just wanted to double check, make sure that this is all just hooking together nicely and starting to make a lot of sense if you take a look at the words used and what they actually represent. And by the way, the British Empire, just one example of how Rome continues to thrive and survive afterwards. Go ahead. I was giving lectures in England. I traveled around England giving lectures a few years back. And I, and I got an invitation to speak in a city called York, England. And there, uh, I knew about York, England, but there I was able to actually see it. I was there where the, where, when Caesar and the Roman Empire invaded Britannia, when the, when the Romans went across the, uh, the, the water and into the islands of Britannia, England and, and Ireland and Scotland. Uh, when Caesar went in, he set up his government to rule over Britannia in a city called York, England. And so today we have New England and we have the Caesar's government called the United Nations is in the city of New York. The UN is nothing more than the old Roman Empire 
now coming into a whole new episode for world domination. It's called the United Nations, which are all humans on the earth are supposed to crawl on their knees and, and, and beat themselves in sackcloth and ashes and submit and pray to the gods for the holiness of the United Nations, which is nothing more than the mafiosi gangster Roman Empire. This is why the Pope is the Pontifex Maximus. He is referred to as the Holy Father. Why? Because he talks to God. He is the God Father. Get it? And so this is why the whole of the United Nations is an underworld criminal organization put there by the Godfather, the Pope, who is the actual Godfather of organized crime on the earth and world government. Rome is still healthy and, and vibrant on the earth. It is now dominating the entire planet. The United Nations and New York. New York is referred to as the Empire State. They have an Empire State building. It's in New England. And so there's a whole world of knowledge that people have not been told. We've grown up watching Bugs Bunny on television and watching football games and silly nonsensical ball games and paying our bills and trying to stay alive, never realizing for a moment that we have as a people and as the American people and as North America, we have been had, we have been raped and plundered by an ancient system of tyranny called the Roman Empire. My God, look at what the Vatican is today. All you got to do if you want to understand what's going on in the Vatican is go rent the movie, the third in the series of Godfather, Godfather 3. It takes you to a, it takes you into the Vatican and shows you that the mafiosi godfather Michael Carleone is doing business with the Holy Father himself. He's actually in the Vatican. The mafia is in the Vatican doing business with the mob, doing business with the Vatican. Why? Because the mob is the Vatican. This is why the Pope wears the yarmulke. It has to do with the old Jewish system of banking. The popes and the, and the cardinals use the, they wear that little beanie cap called a yarmulke. You need to wake up yourself and wake up and find out what's really going on in the world. The whole earth is lying in the power of the prince of darkness. There's an evil presence on the earth that is guiding the destiny of the human race. And we're being guided into a dark future that's coming over on the earth. And we don't even know it. We don't care as long as we got food to eat and being entertained. We got a drugstore on every corner and a liquor store on every corner so we can get all the liquor we want, all the alcohol. And we've got our entertainments and our ball games and all the other silly nonsense that we do to entertain ourselves while we're still here waiting for our, our demise. And so as an old man, I've been looking back on life. I was looking at all this stuff back in 1960, 59 and 60, some 59 years ago. Next year, I will have been doing my work for 60 years. And I've been looking at the continual betrayal of the human family and especially the betrayal of the American people. We've been lied to, deceived set up and, and made to look like fools. And we, all we do is go around and fight wars to protect the, uh, the, the international banking cartels that own the, the drug industry, all the drugs coming out of the, the, uh, the Chinese area and, and Asia where the drugs are coming out. We have to go protect those drug lords. So that's what the wars in the Vietnam were all about. The wars in, Malaysia going on is talking about protecting the drug trades. That's what we are doing with, uh, with our military. Our military is there to protect the uh, international racketeers and international criminals who are running the drug trade around the world. Pornography, white trash, right, white criminality. They're selling children on the, on the market. It's an incredible story about the criminals who are running the human race today. And they're doing it because of what Albert Einstein said. He said the world is very dangerous today, not because bad people 
do bad things, but because good people do nothing. That's why we have the world we have today, because good people don't even care. As long as their bellies are full and they got their beer and their, 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 their stomachs are got plenty of food, they got entertainment and television and their ball games and their play, play games and their computer games. They don't care about what's happening with the rest of the world. As long as we're happy, everything's fine. And our masters who own us keep us entertained by giving us television shows and sitcoms and ball games and all kinds of incredible stuff to keep us busy. While, like George Carlin said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. The people who run this world as a big club, and you have no idea in the world how you are fitting into this scenario. Our well, country has been destroyed. Our country is being raped and plundered by people who want to use us as cannon fodder for their for their wars and violence and their revolutions, and they're keeping us ignorant and stupid by feeding us trash or feeding us crap of what they call education. Our educational system sucks bad. It's gone down the drain. And people all around the world are far more smarter than we are. And they know what America is. They see us for being a bunch of fools. True and enough. So, True enough, Jordan. Hey, you know, uh, Jeremy has a uh, t- has two questions here, actually. Uh, one of them is, is, is a bit odd, so I'm going to put that one first. Uh, when we take a look at America and the UK, uh, they seem to have goddesses connected to them, and it's odd to put them in context with the Roman system. Uh, the goddess in the UK is Britannia. The goddess in America is Columbia. How does this fit into the Roman system and the word of God coming through the Caesar or the Godfather? That's question one. (laughs) Yeah, well, you have to go back into religion and go back and see. It is all based on the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And in all the religions of the world, God always has a female counterpart. In Judaism, the female counterpart of God is called the Shekinah. Shekinah is the female principle of God, uh, the female part of God. And so the Shekinah is what Moses goes up into the, uh, into the mountain to see God and to get the new Ten Commandments. And it says he goes up and he, conf- he confronts God in what is called the burning bush. And the burning bush, if you go on the web, and look at the images and the pictures of burning bush. And many of them show what Shekinah really means. The Shekinah is a feminine principle of God. That God is part female. And this is why when you see on the news at night, if you go on the web and just go to the YouTube to see the Jews that are praying at the Wailing Wall. You will see the Jews at the Wailing Wall. And when they're playing with their, when they're praying to the, to God at the willing wall, they're always bobbing back and forth. They bob back and forth, back and forth as they're praying. The, what are they doing? Why are they bobbing back and forth? It represents they're having sex with God in and out, in and out, bobbing, bobbing back and forth. They're having sex with Shekinah, with the female principle of God, because God is connected in Judaism to sex. Sex is the most important part of the experience of God. That's why you have homosexuality. That's why you have prostitution going all the way back into the ancient world. That were temple prostitutes. Because according to the ancient people, sex was the closest you'll ever get to God. It's the creation of life. Man and woman can create life. It's called sex. No, it's called connecting yourself to the God force. And so it's a really incredible story about what God is in the Middle East and the Jews are praying at the Wailing Wall. And another point about the Wailing Wall is it has nothing to do with Judaism whatsoever. The Jews today believe that the Wailing Wall is a wall connected to the Temple of Solomon, Solomon's Temple, the great King Solomon, wise King Solomon 
his temple, and 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 according to the understanding today, God's temple is the temple of King Solomon, and one of the walls is called the Wailing Wall. Well, in actual point of fact, the wall that the Jews are praying at is actually the wall of a Roman fort built by the Romans, and it don't have anything to do with any King Solomon or King David, zero, nothing. It's a Roman wall. And go back to the encyclopedias and look up the Wailing Wall and look up the word uh, Ant- Fort Antonia. Uh, the Wailing Wall is part of a Roman fort called Fort Antonia, the Fort Anthony, Antonia. And you will see that the Jews are today wailing at the Wailing Wall, praying at the Wailing Wall, which has nothing to do with King Solomon at all. It is a Roman fort built by the Romans, Fort Antonia. Go do some research on it. You'll find out the Jews have been wasting their time putting their prayers into the wall. It's an old Roman fort. It has nothing to do with King Solomon, which incidentally, we, I will say also again, there was no King Solomon. Therefore, if there was no King Solomon, he didn't have a temple in Jerusalem. There was no King Solomon. He never lived. There was no such man. King David, there was no such man. Uh, King Solomon, there was no such man. All these ancient kings and princes and all these uh, uh, highly uh, spiritual names in the Bible, the Old Testament, none of them are actual people. It's just a story. In point of fact, actually, historically speaking, what we call the ancient Israel never existed. There was no ancient Israel. It never existed. So the entire story in the Old Testament is telling you something that happened in ancient times. It was called ancient Israel. But in point of fact, historically speaking, there was no ancient Israel, period. Therefore, the Old Testament is exactly what the New Testament is. It's a metaphor. It's a symbolic metaphor. Or an ancient teachings that goes back into Babylonia, Sumeria, Medo-Persia, and Egypt. It's a Sumerian tale. It goes back to the ancient symbols and, and emblems of world religion. And part of it for us in the West is ancient Israel. But in fact, there was no ancient Israel. That's why the Messiah is not coming back because it's very difficult to come back to something you've never been to to start with. Jesus never existed. It is a symbolic term. There was no Jesus. So if you're expecting Jesus to come back, you're going to wait a long time. We've been waiting for 2,000 years. You've got another 2,000 years to wait because Jesus will not be coming back because the name Jesus is part of an ancient metaphor. It's a symbolic name. If you go back and do your homework and spend some time in a library instead of watching television, you will find out what religion is really all about. It's all about controlling the masses by right. the by the cartels that own the world. Right. Well, Jordan, having done some homework, right, I have a question. I'll, I'll ask the second part of Jeremy's question in a second, but I actually have a question that I want to enter here. Having done some homework, I'm not done with it yet, but uh, I, I started digging into some things, and the idea that uh, the majority of the stories, we'll call them the stories that are contained in the Old Testament, come from Samaria. Okay. Uh, you, you can see them. You can see the flood. You can see uh, virtually everything that is in the Old Testament in Sumerian tales. Now, the problem right. is this. Um, it is not necessarily true, though, that it originated with Samaria because it seems like, from what I can gather so far, that Samaria, it, it, it rose in power at a time and gathered together various people from a lot of different places and it seems like some of them brought even older stories legends religions uh re- religious ideals things like that metaphors they seem to have brought their own metaphors from other places they didn't even necessarily originate with samaria now we can see them brought together in samaria but uh but not all of them necessarily originated there uh, from what I can tell, is is that right? Yes, yes. 
what we call Sumeria, there was actually a proto-Sumerian. There were people long before Sumeria existed. There were people in that area of the world that had collected themselves together and already had their own understandings of theology, religion, gods, etc. And with the first major culture that finally developed in the Middle East, we call Sumerians, they were made up of many different kinds of people with many different belief systems. And out of Sumeria, there came to be a whole story about God and how we were created. And that's all in the book of Genesis, first couple of book, uh, first couple of chapters in Genesis. It's just telling you a story that comes directly out of the ancient Sumerian text. And it's extraordinarily interesting when you see what is actually being said in the book of Genesis that people have never been told before. That's why I believe that there is some valuable material and valuable information in the Bible, but it's encoded. It's a symbolic encoded message. And you have to know where these encoded stories have come from and trace it back into history. I was in business, actual financially, I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin. I gave him a large sum of money to sign a contract with me to be my partner in a business. And I had a lot of time traveling with him and talking with him in private because I was a business partner with him and talking with Zachariah Sitchin about his books and about the story of the Sumerian. And I found out that there was a lot of things about religion I didn't know. And Zachariah Sitchin was fascinating to listen to as he would explain what the words actually meant in the original languages and in the so I came away understanding that there's a whole story that's never been told to the human family. Right. And he was just one person. He was just one of my teachers. Right. And he's I, provided a brilliant piece of the puzzle, but by no means the entire puzzle. And I want to no. follow up with something else here, just an idea really quickly, Jordan, because it occurs to me listening to you that think about ancient Sumeria and the way it came together. And like you said, proto Sumeria, the idea that there were people there and then others came from other places and brought some of their things. And it was sort of cobbled together into what uh, a lot of people talk about as the Sumerian culture, right? Mm -hmm. Well, today we have this place called well, what they used to call America. Anyway, interesting because there are people from all sorts of different cultures who have brought together various customs right here and now. I mean, in my mind, it seems like a, an easily understandable template for what Samaria seems to have done is emerging as we speak in this place we call America, because tell me that we don't have various cultures, various customs, various traditions uh, being cobbled together into what is considered American culture. I mean, does that not make sense to you in, in some sort of way? Absolutely, because what you're doing is you are doing what I've been doing all of my life, and that is pattern recognition. Yes, there is a pattern here. And if you begin to recognize that there's nothing new under the sun. Harry Truman said when he was asked, well, what's new? They asked him what's President Truman, the 33rd president of the U.S., they said, President Truman, what's going on? What's new with you? And he said, the only thing new is the history you've never been told. That's the only thing that's really new. You're going to find out how much you don't know one day, and that's going to be new to you. Yeah, so, and is, isn't that amazing? Because, you know, Harry Truman, as much as he has been criticized and pilloried for a lot of different things, one thing that cannot be said about the guy is that he spoke around things or was indirect. He was pretty direct uh, when he spoke, right? No, he was right? always direct. He was always direct. They called him, what was the term they gave him? He was the old crumbudgeon. He was the old man that just rant and raved and told you what he really thought, whether you like it or not, because he was president. He could do that. And and uh, and so I I always like listening to him. But of course Truman was connected to some very big criminal organizations in the Midwest. Uh, and he was connected to the uh, what was the name of that a criminal family called the Pentagas, the Pentagas Company, the Pentagas family. And he was working with a a, a, a criminal organization called the Pentagas family. 
And so, you know, but that doesn't mean he wasn't he wasn't a good president. It just means that he was well fitted to run the country because he had been working with some of the most powerful underworld organizations before he became president. Right. And, you know, that that brings up exactly where Jeremy asked his second question, uh, because I have taken to using the word cacistocracy lately. Um, now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Jordan knows what this means, but to remind the listeners again what a cacistocracy is and why it is I'm using it, uh, it, it means effectively that it is an organization where the least moral, the least good among the people is at the head of the government. That is why I keep using that word. And here's the thing. I feel very comfortable with it. Jeremy asks basically uh, how how Jordan feels about that in context with where it comes from, from the Greek and all this, uh, which I, I, I could get the exact notation on it. But I'm sure, Jordan, you know what I mean by this and why it is I'm using this term uh, uh, quite liberally lately. It's because I, I only recently discovered it, <laughs> quite honestly. But uh, it seems to fit. And here's the thing about this. When you talked about Truman there and saying that, yeah, he was very plain, very direct, very well-spoken. Uh, you don't ascend to the upper echelon of politics in this country without being corrupt, compromised, in bed with criminal organizations. It's impossible to do so otherwise. And, you know, I, right. I, I, I invite Jordan right now to argue with me about that. And uh, also, uh, Jeremy wants to know uh, <laughs> what what you think about me using the word cacistocracy lately. But uh, I throw both of those things to you, Jordan, and I promise to be quiet now. But I think that these two things are extremely relevant to what you're talking yeah. about. So go ahead. Yeah, well, in The Godfather 3, the third Godfather in the series, at the end of the movie, or toward the very end of the movie, Michael Corleone is the old godfather. The, uh, the, the, he was a young boy, but he's now the old godfather, Michael Corleone. He's sitting out on the porch with his sister. And there's a scene that toward the end of the movie, Godfather 3, where he is talking with his sister and reminiscing over his life. And he said, you know, sis, when I was a young kid, I used to think, that the higher up you go in government, the more legitimately correct everything has to be. It has to be very lawful. Anything uh, going up in government has to be very legitimate and lawful. Now that I am as have reached where in my life where I am, I now know that it's just the opposite. The higher up you go in government, the more corrupt you are. You're not going to get to the top unless you're the most corrupt of all. So that's even in the Godfather movie, Godfather 3, toward the end of the movie, Michael is telling his sister, I thought you know, when you go into government, you have to be very correct and very lawful. But now I find out, no, the mob runs the whole damn show, period. It's all corrupt, period. Bottom line, it's all, spell A-L-L, -L, all corrupt. And you have no idea in the world what they're doing. And you're never going to be told because it's a big club and you ain't in it. That's it. That's it. So so I'm, I'm taking it you have no argument with me basically characterizing no. this as the worst of the worst or the, those who ascend. And that is exactly who the leadership is because that's the way it's actually designed. That's exactly right. Okay. That's why, that's why I said the entire superstructure of Western civilization – is based on all of the darkness of the occult world. Demonism, devil worship, symbols, Satan worship, uh, all kinds of rituals, secret societies, occult orders. And believe me, you don't want to mess with that arrangement. It's going to take somebody from the outside. It's going to take some kind of an extraterrestrial presence on the earth to deal with that because we humans are not designed to confront the demonic world, the demons and the devils, which are, are loose in the world today. Spirits, dark spirits, are very powerful, very powerful and very evil, and we humans are just not up to dealing with them. We don't even know they exist. We're just watching television, never realizing that the world is being run from the spirit world. That's why the Knights Templars had that term, 
as above, so below. So uh, whatever's happening below, no matter how bad it is, you better look over your head into the spirit world. <clears throat> That's where the real evil is coming from. That's why mankind cannot do anything about the situation he's in because you can't do anything without knowledge. Knowledge is power. So unless you have the power to understand what's going on and how it works and who's running the show and how the show is put together, you can't do anything about the world you live in. You must submit yourself to the powers that be because they will be the, they'll be the ones who own you and they will own your children and they will control the government. They'll control the world. Ultimately, the whole entire world is being controlled by the United Nations, which is nothing more than an ancient Roman Empire reestablishing itself now on the earth to control the whole damn world. And there's nothing we can do about it because our leaders are the ones who are behind it and helped it finance and put it together. And that's what our wars and our and our and our educational system is leading us into. They're guiding our destiny. And one day, America is going to awaken to the fact that we've been had. And it's going to be a terrible day when we find out what we have really become and what we, the American people, have allowed to happen in our name. There were wars all over the world, and Obama was given the Peace Prize for being a, such a peaceful man. There were like 35 major wars that he was involved in for a Peace Prize. My God, what a disgrace America has become. What a disgrace this country has become. We promote criminals, incredible dark stuff going on in our banking industry, in our military, in our industrial complex, in our medical, in our educational systems, in our systems of law and courts. I mean, we even have terms we use when we go to court. Why do you play? Why do you go to court? You play out tennis on a court. That's why you go to court. Well, how do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. You need to wake up and understand that America is a racket. It's a criminal empire. And that there are good people in government who will do the best they can, but they are being overshadowed by very powerful forces that are controlling our government. And People just do not understand how government works, how the banks work, why they work the way they do. And that's a whole story we could get into one day, how our world really actually works. All the governments on the earth are corporations, period. And corporations, we understand and know, cannot make laws. Corporation cannot make laws. There is no such a thing as a corporate law. It's only a law within the corporation. Therefore, corporations cannot make laws. If you work for General Electric, General Electric or General Motors or Ford Motor Company cannot make a law for the country. They're just a company. They don't, can't make a law. They're just a corporation. So if they want to enforce a law, what do we call it? We call it a policy. So the corporations can have their own policy, which is like a law within the government, within the company. They have their own laws and regulations. They're called policies. They're not laws. God didn't give them to them, you know, give us those laws. They're just a policy. That's why today America is a corporation and we have policy makers. We're told, we're told that we have policy makers. Well, when they make a policy, Americans are people who were born and raised with freedom. Suppose the American people don't like your policy of this corporation called United States. And so there's a policy. Well, they have to back up the policy with armaments. So they call it police. So the policymakers make policy for the police to back it up with armaments. So that's why we have police backing up the policy of the plebeians. It's a whole world of words and terms in relation to government and business and policies and, and corporations. And that's why you are a corporation. I've, I've said this to you before. You, yourself, and your wife and children are a corporation according to the law. 
all humans are a corporation. That's why if I see you coming out of a restaurant at two in the morning with some woman, the next day I see you and I tell you, you know that woman you were out with last night, I saw you. She's very bad company. You better watch out for her. She's bad company. And you say, mind your own business. We're getting married. She's going to be my partner. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Business? Company? Partner? That sounds like commerce. Look up the word commerce in a dictionary, a law dictionary. Commerce, one of the first terms uh, in a dictionary for commerce is sex. Go back and read it. Go to a law like the library, get a law dictionary, and look up the word commerce. It's a, it's a symbol for sex. So it's a business. That's why if it's a business, you've got to get a license because it's a business. You need a business license. So if you're going to get married, you're talking about doing business. Thank God it's none of my business. Well, you know, <clears throat> but it is a business. You know, Jordan, this is why everything requires a certificate, and it goes way back before you're in a restaurant with that woman, because you have to have a certificate of live birth. That's right. <laughs> you know, where, where they prove and establish your serial number and all that good stuff. Now, some people call this the world of fictions, and here's the thing about it. It's not fiction. Now, uh, why, why do I say that? Everybody goes, well, that doesn't have to do with the living man or woman. And, well, in, in one sense, you're sort of correct, but not really. And here's why I'm going to say this. And, and uh, I, I don't think I've ever gone through this with you, Jordan, really quickly because we've only got a few minutes left. But let me just check my thinking here. Um, to contract, to create certificates, to do this with language and paper, you know, it, it, it eerily resembles ritualistic control that is exerted through various practices that, well, are not fiction. They're actually under the category of what some people might call magic. And this is how you exert control, you know, even when we see the legendary stories of people going and making deals with the devil or demons or whatever, they always require a contract. And there always has to be proof of things in said contract. And there is language. And all of this is really about one thing, and that is about worldwide control. That is why the systems exist as they do. This wasn't the beautiful creation of some bureaucratic numbers cruncher. These things all actually serve a purpose as well, and I don't think people even who understand that they wish to be free of it uh, fully recognize the actual meaning. Um, how, do, how do you feel about what I'm talking about here? Well, no, you're exactly right, and I understand, but only I, I, you'd have to have the background on this subject to understand what you just said. I have the background because I've been listening to and studying all of the experts on international maritime law, on, on state citizenship. There's a whole world of knowledge that the American people have never been privy to know about how the government works in America, how America was founded, how it was paid for, who paid for it, and how we became involved in a civil war and what was going on there and who financed the wars that we are in. There's a whole world of knowledge on how the world works. And I've been talking about this stuff for many years that the people do not know. They're involved in something they've never been told right. and they don't know. Well, let me, and, and, let me show you the pattern recognition that you have taught me personally. And it, it, it's really simple here, folks. It's going to sound a little crazy if you weren't paying attention. Uh, but here's the bottom line. You know, at the beginning of the show, we started talking about the true connection, the true communication with the God, right? And how that has been convoluted and they've erected an entire system which is there allegedly to do exactly that and to make the world run and to make the world make sense to you. And that is having you pray and do these other things instead of directing your energy toward this space in Cassiopeia. No, we don't do that. We are meant to be kept away from it by the system. Guess what? Exactly the same thing is done, even if you take what they say is religion out of the equation, exactly the same thing has been done 
on all levels here. This idea of commerce and doing business with one another and actually interacting with one another has all been hijacked in exactly the same fashion. So it seems to me as though the story of religion is the story of the government, is the story of business, is the story of the way this world has been constructed. It is not separate in any way, shape, or form. It is literally the same playbook being utilized no matter which direction you turn in and you think you're going in a different place. I'm going to look at how government functions as opposed to religion. No, you're not. It's the same thing. I'm going to look at how people have been taught to speak instead of, you know, the way the language was originally constructed and how that's been manipulated. That's a different thing. No, it's not. It's the same thing. Jordan, right before we finish here, just tell me something. Am I, am I way out of my head here? No, 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 no. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Well, and and that's, but, that's but the thing, people though. have no idea what we're talking about because most people have never been told how commerce and business work. Right. And, and the religious and, significance of that is, like I said, just the same as the governmental significance, just the same as the social significance, so to speak. It is all the same story. And, and, the, and the truth is that uh, attempting to unlock these things does take the amount of time that you put into it over yeah. more than half a century. And, and again, the benefits of all of that can be found if you go into the research society at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of sections that, again, seem to be, you know, they have different headings. They're really the same story. It's all about the manipulation of the man and the woman on the planet to be kept away from, oh, I don't know, the natural order. They've given you a new order so that you can navigate their world, and that is indeed a new world order. And <laughs> the fact is that uh, that story doesn't just keep itself, you know, in the world of religion, in the world of money, in the world of government, in the world of media and the manipulation of the mind. It is all the same story being told simultaneously across every platform on the planet. JordanMaxwellShow.com is Jordan's website.